Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lynn Horn, and I'm the Director of the Office of Research Integrity at, the, at UCT. And I, I thank so much for an opportunity um, to speak on the Cape Town Statement. Um, so, my background is nothing to do with bioimaging. Um, I'm, a, I'm a medical doctor and I worked for 20 years in grassroots medicine before I actually migrated into bioethics. Um, and now I'm more in research integrity. But the Cape Town Statement, whoops. Right, um, there we go. So the Cape Town Statement was an output of the Seventh World Conference on Research Integrity, and which happened at the um, end of May last year. And there were a lot of people involved, which is, so this is just a quick acknowledgements um, slide. And I think, why did we have such a statement at, at this, at a research integrity con conference? And, there, this is just a background slide. In terms of my my journey around issues of equity and fairness in research has been quite a long one. I have a very checkered career, um, starting as a medical doctor, working in very resource limited um, settings here in Cape Town um, in the Cape Flats for many years, and then migrating as into in, in ethics as an ethicist, actually working with research teams um, around HIV and TB research, and then eventually becoming an ethics advisor for EDCTP and working um, at going to sites, clinical trial sites, and working with big teams that were often led from the global north. I'm told they are not supposed to use that term, that it's a bit, but I'm going to talk about global north and global south. Often multiple sites in Africa um, and led from the global north and just listening to researchers talking to me uh, gave me a real sort of insight, a growing insight um, into this issue of, of, of equity in research collaborations. If these are just a couple of examples, and there's been so much written about this. Um, I'm just going to, this is one paper, um, and I'll just read the bit that's highlighted that says, and it's a bit drastic, and it might not well be true for many cases, but it certainly is true for quite a number of cases. Western investigators generally formulate the research questions, design the studies, obtain the funding, conduct the analyses, and present the findings in conferences held in the West, and publish the findings in journals that are often unavailable for African um, Africans, African investigators investigators typically collect the data and have limited opportunities to make intellectual co contributions to the process. Um, two published stories, one involves our, public, um, our authors from UCT that did an a, a examination of um, research published on COVID in top medical journals and found that although the data were COVID in Africa, the data all came from Africa, 66% of the authors on those journals were not from Africa. And um, in fact, 20% had n no, no African authors at all. Um, another example, which was an open letter to a journal, was of a US 30 million um, um, award awarded to UK, US and Australian researchers for malaria data research. Um, and at the, the big launch which happened, there was not a single African researcher or institution um, that was mentioned in that at that launch or in the press release. So these are just some examples. After we had published um, the Cape Town Statement, which was published in Nature, uh, in Nature Nature then actually published this article afterwards where they went and interviewed a number of um, researchers working in the Global South. And the title of the article was Pack Up the Parachute, Why Global North-South Global North-South collaborations need to change. And I won't read all of these out, but the, it, it, it's also a really interesting article and definitely worth um, having a read. 
So there are many initiatives around equity and fairness in research collaborations and research contexts. This is another one um, which also has happened in Africa, African Charter for Equitable Partnerships, um, which, which um, was signed around July this year. But I think what was specific about the Cape Town Statement was that it's linked research integrity to research fairness and equity. And I think that that was an, is novel in terms of the, the things that have come before and the many initiatives that are, you know, the, the Association of Commonwealth Universities also has developed a toolkit for equity, which is in, very, very useful. It's got all sorts of things. But I think that this link of inequity and unfairness to research integrity is what was really critical. Um, so, in fact, I had unpacked all of this in a whole number of slides, but I realized that oh, that wasn't going to work with the 15 minutes allocated to me. So I've tried to just summarize, but I think it, you can actually look at every every part of the research life cycle and point out where inequity and unfairness can impact on research integrity. And, you know, one of the first issues is around research priority and agenda setting and imposed agendas, lack of local research and community engagement um, at the proposal development stage, leading sometimes to deprioritizing of important research questions. And I've had personal experience of this within the clinical trial environment where, you know, where, where you can see that, that some of the things that the, the local researchers would like to have had on the table have now been taken off the table. Um, issues around funding, often there are arduous due diligence requirements that are only imposed on foreign recipients. And um, the, often is lack of funding for indirect costs for research system support, um, imposed budgets, cost cutting, sometimes shortcuts leading to what we call in the research integrity jargon as QRPs or questionable research practices. And I've seen the, an example that I've, ha I've had to be involved with on more than one project is data fabrication by community workers who have been contracted on very short, on, you know, very sort of short-term contracts. They pulled out of the community. They made to go door to door to collect data in certain studies. And they have to do so many, you know, and this is difficult work, so many. And so I, I, at least in, in the last while, I won't say these were big studies with international funders where there have been issues with research field workers, um, you know, fabricating data. So, and then the other one which we all know about is authorship and publication and, and you know, to such an extent that a journal like The Lancet have now said that if they receive um, articles um, submissions w where the data comes from places like Africa or India and there's no um, co-authors, and this happens quite frequently, they are now going to turn these, these papers down. So um, the, the other area where I wanted to just go in a little bit more detail was around data coll coll collection, analysis, storage. So obviously research integrity requires that data is analyzed, stored, reanalyzed, shared in a manner that's trustworthy, scrupulous, transparent, uh, maximizes utility of the data. And inequity and unfairness and lack of diversity can undermine the integrity of this phase of the research in a whole number of ways. So inadequate support systems at under-resourced institutions can result in data being stored and protected suboptimally. Um, then another big issue that which was really discussed at length during our discussions leading up to the Cape Town Statement was the, the whole thing about funder requirements for very early sharing of data um, that can force under-resourced collaborators to have to share data on open platforms before they've had an opportunity to to interrogate the data themselves, and which they've usually been instrumental in collecting. And um, so th that, that, that was something that was discussed at length. And then this issue of once the data has been put on, on um, open resources, the fact that often better resourced researchers from HRCs can be more agile at being able to use the data quickly. But sometimes um, secondary analyses that are done by those 
that are removed from the context or the environment or the community um, where the data was collected may produce analyses that are biased or interpreted incorrectly. And I know that this is probably not going to be relevant to you, you know, in bioimaging and that, but certainly I have been, um, been, been come across things where, where researchers, you know, d studying things like domestic violence in our one of our local um, communities here where the researchers are coming entirely from you know from from um, countries up north and and the, the 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 problem of that being possibly reported on fetal alcohol syndrome is another one um, reported on with a, a way that can stigmatize communities um, can become really problematic so um, uh, yeah, I won't go, go into this in a lot of detail in the interest of time. So what did we do with the Cape Town statement? And I think it's important to this, I, I've included this because I think it's really important that this was a real collaborative effort. It wasn't just me sitting down and trying to write on this. Um, we made a proposal to the Seventh World Conference um, Program Committee and, and, and it, it was a bit of a tough sell to say actually because you know, equity and fairness is not traditionally part, thought to be a research integrity issue, but to say it actually is, and, and this is the first time the conference was going to be held in Africa, and, and we really want to put this on the table. So we had... Um, we had a lot of pre-con. We we actually had a a, a a bridging conference virtually because of COVID, and where we introduced the topic. And from that, we had a whole lot of pre-conference Zoom discussions. We developed a background um, paper, which was you know which which was. Um, uploaded well before the conference and then at the conference they allocated a plenary session and two 90-minute focus group focus sessions where we had roundtable discussions and then obviously extensive post-conference um, input and I think the fact that 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 this was a real issue these were all articles that were published really within the week of the conference so nature picked up on it um, science picked up on it helicopter research comes under fire at Cape Town Conference, um, University World New News, renowned journal rejects papers that exclude African researchers. Um, so all of these w actually came out in, in the week of the conference. And then the, the statement itself um, was published via an article in Nature. So the, this, the article in Nature really unpacks the, why the statement was needed and what the issues were, but it isn't the statement. Um, the actual statement, oopsie, what happened there? Oh, we've gone, oh dear. <laughs> um, sorry. Now, there, okay. oh, there we go, okay. Um, yeah, the Cape Town Statement is available on the, the website of the World Conferences on Research Integrity Foundation, and it's also available to download in a poster format, so you can actually download it and put it up on, 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 on your um, laboratory wall. And it has it, it 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 it's it's twenty statements really collected under um, five different value statements, if you like. And I, I'm obviously not going to read all of them; that would be boring. But I'm just going to highlight highlight one or one or two. So the first one is around diversity and inclusivity as a pathway to fair practice, and. It says funders from high income countries should aim to avoid so called helicopter research by including diversity stipulations and funding call calls and funding local researchers directly. So, journals and publishers should question the practice of excluding local researchers from low income and middle income countries from authorship when data from LMRCs um, ha and have a low threshold for rejecting such papers. The second value statement is fair practice from conception to 
implementation. And one of the things we've tackled there is around um, the, the, the barriers that many LMIC researchers face around open science. So barriers to open science participation by researchers working in low resource settings need to buy be identified and addressed by publishers and other um, stakeholders. The third, the third group of statements is mutual respect as a pathway to trust. Um, and, and, and this one I've highlighted here is about what I've already mentioned, priority and agenda setting. But, but the thing that also came up is about unsurfaced power imbalances in teams and how so often they, these ride below the surface and that there needs to be <coughs> mechanisms to actually surface these right at the beginning of collaborations and projects. Um, then we talk about shared ac accountability and I'm just highlighting this one. I know we have some funders in the room, but LMIC governments need to recognize the value of funding research to support locally relevant research priorities and be accountable for uh, for reducing reliance on HIC funders. And then the last one is around indigenous knowledge, um, recognition and, and epistemic um, justice, which is a, a big issue and I was really glad to have it included in the statement. So, so that's just the Cape Town statement in a nutshell and thank you so much for letting me speak to you about it. Thanks.